Hey Rebels, my name is Matthew Barton and I'm the host of the Rebellion Brewing Podcast. A few months ago, I was sitting down with some of the Rebellion team and we were dreaming up possibilities for our oatmeal stout beer. As it stands, it's one of our slowest selling beers of all time. Outside of possibly myself, almost no one is drinking it. I've done my best. I'm over triple digits on untapped. It doesn't matter. No one's buying it. As a brewery, it makes no sense to brew a beer that no one wants to buy. That's just dumb. But we know we like stout and we want to figure out how to sell more of it. And that's when the conversation veered into the topic of coconut. People love coconut. You slap coconut on a beer and immediately a segment of the market immediately rushes in and comes and buys it. But we have a problem, a fundamental problem that our brewers face. We don't use artificial flavors. We use raw ingredients and the shaved coconut that we would toast on site before it goes into the brew. Well, some people just can't taste it. They have no idea they cannot taste real coconut. They can taste artificial coconut and they're used to tasting it in candy bars and sweet flavored drinks and other nonsense like that. But in terms of the artificial flavors that exist in the ecosystem of our food and drink, you can't taste authentic coconut. For some people, they just can't. So every time we launch a coconut beer, people complain they can't taste the coconut and they trash it on untapped and they give it crappy ratings and they say, you guys suck and you don't know how to do a coconut beer. And the beer could be thick enough to stand a spoon up in. They just never taste it. So if you cannot taste an authentic coconut beer, I'm asking myself, is it even worth mentioning? Does it actually exist? It's like trying to explain mortgage rates to bumblebees without any meaningful context. Is the concept of calling it a coconut beer even relevant? And then something funny happened. Good Beer Hunting, an industry blog for beer, published an article that discussed the very nature of reality, how nothing we perceive is truly real, and asking the reader, what is real beer? What makes beer real? And one of my favorite beer literati, Jordan St. John, was quoted in the article with some very profound ideas. I hadn't even finished reading the article, and I was begging him to come on the podcast to talk to me about what is real and what is real beer. Luckily, he got back to me fairly quickly and he said, yeah, he'll come on the show. So let's get into it. Jordan, welcome to the show. Hey, you know me. I'm glad to be anywhere with a zip code. (laughs) What's going on in in Jordan St. John world? Oh, man, it's kind of an interesting one. I mean... Obviously, you know, there's a certain amount of Twitter buzz around that piece on good beer hunting, but I I think we talked about that like months ago. Like, so I've been waiting for that to come out. I actually wrote a companion piece to it for my blog um, that I published before this came out because I didn't know what was coming. Uh, So it's been a little bit quiet down here. Um, You know, I've been working uh, at George Brown, which is I'm at the culinary school there. I'm in charge of their beer certificate. In fact, I grew the program from one course to three courses. So I've got that going on. We're working on the Growler. Uh, it's back up in Ontario. I think we're going to start that fall winter. And, you know, there's other stuff happening. Working for the LCBO Food and Drink magazine, which is a really interesting experience. Um, especially since I know comparatively little about spirits, and I'm now compelled to write about spirits. So it's going to be a fun learning experience. It's going to be great. I think if you've got a really strong beer palate, the vocabulary can transfer those skills very much the same. Certainly the uh, the palate portion transfers, the ability to describe what your tasting does, but there are uh, little politesses, little niceties that you have to observe when you're talking about wine. You know, (laughs) I I feel like there are descriptors that they use that we don't and vice versa. And spirits, I think that's just a free-for-all based on what I'm seeing from the Whiskey Bible this week. (laughs) Holy Christ. I can't believe how that exploded. I wasn't even aware that was going on. Uh, if there's one thing I've learned in this life, it's that you should never take the word of a man who wears a fedora unironically. Seriously, you can't. I mean, it, it, he's like a 62-year-old man in a white Panama hat. No, you cannot take that man seriously. <laughs> For the audience, just so they know, there was a very famous whiskey writer And what happened was he kept including very sexually explicit descriptions of whiskey, fairly inappropriate at any given time, but quite tone deaf during Me Too. And 
I, I couldn't believe he'd gotten away with writing that stuff for so long. Well, apparently he's self-published, meaning that he doesn't really have an editor. And I think a, a good editor probably would have shaken him out of that habit. So <laughs> always have somebody look over your stuff unless you're pretty sure that it's so obscure that nobody is going to challenge it at all. I mean, somebody challenged me this morning on the fact that maybe Pasteur didn't work as extensively as with Carlsberg as I thought. <laughs> uh, I mean, it was not a, a vicious critique. It was about one tweet worth of material. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think at Rebellion, we try to make it look like we're screwing around and just goofing off and having fun. But a lot of thought goes into every single post. Um, every single video, somebody else has watched it besides me, even though... I finished editing it. I don't just fire it off into the universe. I say, please look at this and make sure I didn't do something stupid. Yeah. You really have to at this point because nobody's individual sensibility is able to cover everything. I, I don't, you know, I think creativity is usually not a collaborative effort. I think it's something that there's one person behind. There's like a driving force, but by the same token, in, in order to figure out how it's going to land, you really do need a little bit of help. One of the things that's been on my mind ever since I read that article was what the hell does Jordan really think and what did he really intend? Because I feel like sometimes you can get lost in translation. It's a very heavy topic. Well, I mean, one of the problems is that uh, I kind of write the way I talk and I talk in full paragraphs. Uh, and that's a very big problem to have. It means that you're going to use language that isn't necessarily understandable in an immediate sense. Uh, I try not to swear a whole lot. I feel like that would probably accentuate various points if I threw in the odd F-bomb. But, uh, you know, I, I do when I'm not on, like, being interviewed. There, there's just a streak of blue coming at the top of the place. Um, yeah, it's, it's always interesting with the, the simulacra thing. I mean... I think we should probably, for people who haven't read that article, we should maybe talk about what it says a little. Okay, let's back up. In the article, where did where did you come in? Well, I, I was talking to Lily about it um, comparatively early when she was writing it. And she was still getting a grasp of the, the material because Baudrillard is a very difficult philosophical construct to like get to. Um, and to, to be just, uh, I'm completely honest, I'm, I'm impressed that she put in the work. I mean, the amount of effort that she put into that piece, not just in terms of the writing and the interviewing, but also the, the grasp of the subject matter, is, is really masterful. I thought it was fantastic. Um, but, you know, the, the problem is that you can over-explain the thing, and you can get away from it. I think uh, of the people who she interviewed, Dr. J., uh, Doc probably did better. Like she's arguing, there are donuts and beer. Beer doesn't mean anything anymore. It's fine. Um, <laughs> it, which is maybe the easiest way to explain that. I, in the course that I teach, right? Like I teach people about beer styles. It's the course I'm teaching currently. Um, and one of the things that crops up is, you know, for a, for a couple of years, I was doing it by culture and geography. So I had a week on Germany. I had a week on England. I had a week on Belgium trying to explain like the weird hybridized cafe culture that springs up and they're kind of recreating the 16th century, but they're also still like very firmly ensconced in the 1850s and just coming up with stuff on the fly. Um, and you're explaining all of that. You realize that by about the year 2010 in Canada, I think that's the watershed moment, stuff stops being defined by culture and geography and starts being defined by ingredients. Like it starts being defined not by formal structures that exist, but by people's sense of exploration. And as soon as you get to that point, like categorical structures like beer styles kind of go out the window. So when you're talking about something like a New England IPA, and you know we're referring to it in, in semiotic language as being a construct, um, that's not the easiest way to put it. The easiest way to put it is that there are all these little steps away from traditional English IPA. Like originally it's 7% alcohol. Uh, by 1900 in Canada, pale ale was usually 7% alcohol, quite bitter. So it, it is basically the British IPA, but it's what we're making locally. And then, you know, it disappears because lager 
It becomes very popular earlier than people think. It actually becomes really popular after about 1879, as soon as the ref refrigeration. People say prohibition and lager. No, not true. Earlier. Um, O'Keefe's got like 500,000 barrels of production by the First World War. So by the time you reintroduce IPA, you've got these English IPA variants that are much lower in alcohol. They're like 4%. You've had Eagle IPA, presumably the Charles Wells one. It's not great, but it sort of explains the thing a little. And then you get Cascade hops and Sierra Nevada and then Lagunitas and then like Blind Pig, so there's double IPA and it gets bigger and then they screw around with the hop character and the yeast character. And eventually, it's, it's like the, the janitor's mop, right? There's the analogy where if you replace the handle, but you still have the head of the mop, is it still the same mop? What if you replace the, the head of the mop and put a new one onto the new handle? It's still the same mop, right? No, eventually it's a whole new mop. Um, and we've reached the point with New England IPA, especially where it's just like, it's not bitter. It's not really very alcoholic. I've seen a lot of them that are down around five, down around four and a half. And it doesn't really bear any resemblance to the thing that it's named after. We do a hazy session IPA called Golden Crush. Tons and tons of hops, but we don't even call it a IPA because people get confused. Well, yeah, I mean... It's really weird to watch because people will say, I like hoppy beer, but they don't mean bitter anymore. So it's, it's changed the way that people use language, which is fascinating to watch and a real pain in my ass, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> we, uh, we're behind you because we still have that problem where people will say to us, I don't want a bitter beer. I can't handle that face melting, bitter awfulness. And at the brewery, our staff were like, man, this beer is so hoppy. You're going to love it. And they're like, no, they're scared of it because it's, it's, they, they're thinking it's going to punch them in the mouth. But really, it's a New England style, hazy, fluffy, juicy. It's a kiss on the lips. And if we just didn't tell them it was an IPA and we just serve it to them, they love it. They're just like, oh, my God, this is amazing. And I'm like, but surprise, you love hops. So we're still in that transition. We're, we're behind you guys. Well, sense. I mean, to, to wrap it around to, the, to your intro, I mean, you've got hops that now do specific things. Like, we went from Cascade, which is like, okay, so it's whole leaf initially, and you've got this pine thing, and you've got this ur citrus thing. It's not even really white grapefruit yet. It's just like, here's some stuff. It's, it's kind of California-ish. Like, this is the stuff that grows in California, pine trees and citrus. There you go. Um, and then... You know, as they develop sea hops through the USDA breeding program, you end up with Centennial, so it's like lots of pine. And then Columbus, so more orange. And then Citra, where it's just like lemon and cat pea. And eventually <laughs> you get to the point where it's like Equinot, so it's green pepper and peach, which that's an odd one. But uh, And then Sabro, which is like the hop of the moment, which does taste like coconut. So if you wanted to make a stout with Sabro hops, people would look at like you like you were crazy because you weren't making a, a juicy IPA with it. You'd get the same coconutty thing, but you'd be like massively dry hopping a stout in order to get the coconut character. So I'm gonna, I, I bumped on something there. You said Equinot? Yes. It used to be Equinox. Okay, I've been pronouncing it incorrectly then. I, I, was, I was calling it Equinot. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure that they care as long as they have the trademark. <laughs> what tends to happen in Ontario is like there are three hop suppliers for the entire industry there's like Hops Connect, uh, Charles Ferrum and there, there's another one whose name I forget temporarily but like Bob Latimer who's the hop guy goes around to all the breweries and sells them hops he's like have you tried this hop yet and he'll just he'll make a circuit right you can tell which breweries he's been to because they suddenly oh we have a Sabro beer now did you talk to Bob <laughs> uh it's it's um the, the fruit puree guys do the same thing it's uh guava really <laughs> i can't remember what the name is now i believe it's cashmere but we're gonna wet hop a cashmere beer and it has a fuzzy peach candy character to it yes i've had uh, cashmere i made a beer with some ontario cashmere a couple of years ago with great lakes and we liked it a lot we made a cream ale with it because I, I always feel like it's a terrible idea to make an IPA with new hops. 
I mean, it's, it's what people are expecting. You got to hit them in the funny bone, you know? That's where they expect at least, to quote a great songwriter. Um, so if you can make something that's like a, a light lager, but with a different hop variety or like a Belgian gold nail, like the Duval triple hop that's in Ontario now is a cashmere hop. And it's like, it's massively more interesting than just getting another IPA. I think um, you, you have all this potential and people overlook the potential because, you know, juicy, hazy. Ah. I feel like there's, there's three things for us in our market. There's the regular, what we kind of call the farty old guy beer. That's just, it's, it's a beer beer. Miller or High Life. Right. Yeah. Then there's the big, bold, juicy orange juice. We're basically serving orange juice. That that triggered me in the article, but then I thought about it more. I was like, yeah, I called the beer orange juice, but I'm like, that's essentially what it's It's, it's is. very infantilizing. It means that your audience is like, oh, can we have juice, please? Like, it, as soon as you realize that, it's very difficult to sit there in your tap room and go, oh, they want it in a sippy cup. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And then on the the third track is kind of like the candy dessert beers. So they're yeah. less interested in yeah. hops and they're more like put a donut in it, put some cereal in it, um, make it wacky yeah. and stupid. And I mean, I've seen the Fruit Loops beers. I've seen like, a, you know, there, there are sometimes there are good ideas, right? There are things that just make sense. Like I, we did a, a beer with Great Lakes Brewing back in the day. It was called Lazarus Breakfast Stout. It was back when they were on their 100-liter pilot system. It was like 2012 or something. And for 2012, it was a groundbreaking beer. It might have been earlier than that, even. Um, we had a 7% oatmeal stout with cocoa, cinnamon, ancho chili, and coffee in it. It was brilliant. Like, it was really good. Uh, it was way too advanced for the market at the time. And we released it two years later. Like, we brewed a new batch of it. And it, it was very, very popular at that point. I think if you released it now, it would be like, if you advertised it as something you could dip churros in, people would be into it. But you need like pastry to be in that thing in order to sell that beer now. Uh, I also, I ruined their pilot system with that because we didn't realize you have to use powdered cinnamon. We put cinnamon sticks in. And it turns in the, out that the outflow valve on their kettle was exactly the same diameter as their pump. So the cinnamon stick went right into the pump. And for the next oh, no. three, four batches, they were like, why does everything taste like cinnamon? <laughs> I feel worse than I should about that. <laughs> so we circle back. You're talking a bit about the history and creating the context in which beer is understood. And we see the evolution of not only the consumer's preference, but what brewers can do with the product. Where does that take us? It's a, it's a really interesting question. The problem that you have is that inspiration is not immediate. Like, the, the issue being, when you got into the craft beer thing in Ontario in a really serious way, I think 2010 is the year it sort of kicks off. We start getting more and more breweries, which is incidentally when I started writing about beer. So I've been observing this the whole time. When you had less stuff in the market, like less things existed, it was harder to be influenced by them. People did come up with original ideas periodically. Or, you know, you didn't have 8,000 breweries in the US and 1,000 breweries in Canada, all with Instagram accounts, all sharing like, this is a tease about the new beer we're gonna make, it's got grapefruit. You know, we've, we've, um, we've zested 13 boxes of grapefruit this morning at our brewery. Or, look at these donuts, they're going into a beer. <laughs> or, you know, we're going to let the dog swim in this. Um, <laughs> you know, so th the problem is that it does become very quickly um, sort of descending in terms of the cycle of trend. So trends happen faster and faster and faster. And eventually, I think you get to the point where there's not any more ideas to be borrowed from other places. And I think that's going to coincide with this situation that we're in now from a market standpoint, where, you know, some people are probably not going to survive the COVID thing. And I'm not sure that, like, from a... It, it was probably going to happen as a result of the dying off of trend as well. So you, you've hit this perfect storm kind of situation. 
hopefully what you end up with are people who are making really good beers survive. And, you know, people who are uh, tight knit with their communities survive. That would be fantastic. But ultimately what you kind of need to do is your own thing. If you look at the breweries that are really hyped in Ontario at the moment, one of them is Godspeed, for example. Luke uh, LaFontaine, he's just making beer that he wants to drink. Like he's making a Czech pale lager and an Oktoberfest beer. And he's making, you know, I, he did release an IPA, but it was based on an IPA he made in 2009 with Sean Hill from Hill Farmstead. So it's like, all right, we'll let him have that one. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, he's got that niche thing happening. A lot of the breweries that I appreciate at this point, they're not just chasing the new thing. Um, they're kind of, they, they have preferences. They have things they enjoy, and they're trying to do them really well. And I think that the people who chase trend are setting themselves up for failure because novelty requires you to be continually on top of the ball. Like, you have to be releasing something new all the time, and it's exhausting. I, I think that you run through staff that way. I think that you run through... Uh, potential that way very quickly. There's a brewery in Toronto, I won't name names, but they have a series that they put out where experimental beers, and some of them have very clever names. It's Blood Brothers, it's just Blood Brothers. Um, the series of beers is called Devil's Trill. And my understanding from talking to the brewer, and they may no longer be doing this, was that every time they released a Devil's Trill beer, they were trying out a new technique. And if they liked the technique, they would immediately institute using that technique across the brewery. So based on one experimental beer, you might change the IPAs that exist on a year-round basis. It, it kind of guarantees that you're never going to be able to sell the same beer twice, you know? Um, so I've never had the same IPA from them twice. I've ordered the same IPA. I've just never drunk the same IPA. You know, it doesn't really taste all that similar. Sometimes more hazy, sometimes juicier, sometimes drier, but never the same. And it's, it's baffling to me that that's a business practice. Because as you were saying, if you make a beer that doesn't sell, I mean, that would be really, really bad. Fortunately for them, they're very hyped up. They've got all this great branding, so they're just selling their beer. It's, it's fine. But uh, if, if they didn't have the marketing, if they didn't have the cachet in the market, they would be in a lot of trouble. One of the sentences that was coming out of my mouth just as you were explaining about a minute ago was, are we at the end of beer? No, absolutely not. Beer has existed since like 12,000 BC. I mean, if, if you want to think about it, like in terms of prehistory and sociology and anthropology and all that stuff, you're talking about like the Natufian people who basically figure out how to grind grain and what they, they make beer and bread, basically. It's like a porridgey kind of thing. It's, it's beer is part and parcel of humanity. As long as there's humans, there's beer. I mean, what we might be getting towards the end of is the aberrative period where macro brewers kind of control the thing. And like in Ontario, I, it used to be that Labatt and Molson controlled something like 90% of the market. And at this point, I think they're down to 60. I mean, Moosehead and Brick are probably up to 10%. Imports are about 10%. Craft beer, maybe close to 20. So, you know, this what we've done really is subvert the structure. We're creating a new normal that's bottom up rather than top down. So there are small breweries, and it's, it's like more part of society. If you were to walk down the street in 2010 in Toronto, even as a beer writer, you know, chances are you were never going to run into anybody whose um, job description was brewer. I mean, given the fact that you go to a lot of beer bars, probably have a better than average chance too, but it's just not all that likely. <laughs> so, you know, 2020, walking down the street, you know, run into brewers, taproom staff, sales reps, marketing agents, Mexican bandits, Methodists. Sorry, that's Hedley Lamar. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it employs a lot of people. I think it's good for the community. One of the best things about it is, like, the way that people consume beer has changed a lot. The taproom model is really good for that. And in an increasingly secular society, uh, one of the things that I think beer does when it's done properly is bring people together. So you've got, like, a 
congregational aspect to it. Uh, and I'm not a beer evangelist. I just think that if you can make people's lives slightly better on a daily basis, you probably ought to do that. Um, and good beer helps with that. And so does good company. But, you know, it's, it's not sitting in your garage drinking a two for it's a, it's a very different thing than that. Uh, and this is not the kind of conversation that you could have had 10 years ago. Um, you know, a lot of the influences that needed to exist did not in order for us to even talk about this. So, yeah, I'm not worried about the end of beer. What I am a little bit worried about is uh, you have a lot of young people in the industry who are exuberant. They want to create things. And they don't necessarily understand that you have to sell the things that you create. And uh, there has to be a market and there has to be desire for it. Um, <laughs> you know, seasonals were good back when you had like a beer that you would release every year. Uh, the principle is called, how, will, how can I miss you if you won't go away? You know? uh, one of my favorite beers in Toronto is Nutcracker Porter made by Black Oak, as you can see. Um, it was like the first seasonal beer I ever had. It might have been 2007 or 8, maybe even before that. And it's just a porter with cinnamon in it. But it came out in November. And, you know, you could usually get it on cask somewhere in town. So it had this lovely velvety texture. And it, uh, you know, made a real impression. And the fact that it only comes out once a year makes it special. As opposed to being like, it's July. Let's drink pastry stouts. Yay! Pastry stouts. Ah! I love that you mentioned that. Uh this week was the very first week we announced the arrival of our fall beer lineup. Ooh. Four beers, four okay. seasonal beers. One of them might become full-time if it does well enough. And we launched them a month ago, but we didn't tell anyone because it just takes us a while to hit every location in the province. It's pointless to tell people, hey, this, this brand new uh, fall beer with the cinnamon and clove and all that lovely stuff that you want for your pumpkin latte spice season well it's, this is no point telling it if they can't get it on the shelves so we have to we wait about a month we're, we're getting better at that we're getting smarter <laughs> you know it's not the end of pumpkin spice season it's the beginning it's it's really weird watching the pumpkin spice thing happen um for a long time in ontario it was a really big deal like when i was writing the the column for the sun which was nationally syndicated, I think, making the, uh, the Ontario-specific content a bit enervating to people in Alberta. Um, I would have to go through all the pumpkin beers that were in the market. So there's Great Lakes had one, and Grand River, and um, we'd get Pumpkin from Southern Tier. We'd get, like, Post Road from Brooklyn. I'm sorry that happened to you. And every year, I had to taste all of them, and I had to rank them best to worst. Ugh. This was the second, second worst column of the year. The worst was St. Patrick's Day. Because <laughs> it's like, how do I say something new about Guinness? <laughs> Five years in a row. We, um, we stepped in a bear trap with that. We made a joke beer, just a green Lucky Charms joke beer, just to make fun of it. And then it sold like in an hour. Sold out. Like people were lined up. We're like, what is, no, we're making fun of this. <laughs> we're, we're trying to be ironic and then so the, the next year people were asking oh you're gonna do another one of those green lucky charms beers and like no we were making fun of it and then we had to do it again and our brewers are just like <laughs> let, me, let me tell you the best way i've ever seen anybody get out of that there's a beer uh made by a brewery in ontario called cayman kettle and cayman kettle they're from font hill ontario they were very small so they were making like very small batches of beer and putting them in like glass carboys. They had the big wine carboys, you know. And we're writing the second edition of the guide and I reach out to them and say, like, I want to put you in the guide. Can you send me some beer so I know what you're about? Um, you know, whatever you send, we'll put in there. Five star rating system. I assume that they're familiar with it because we'd already done one, you know. Um, and basically what had happened behind the scenes, and I didn't figure this part of the puzzle out until later, is that the brewer had decided he never wanted to make a pumpkin beer ever again. <laughs> so they made a beer called Jack-O-Lantern Fire, which was a Scotch bonnet pumpkin beer. And it, it, it tasted like burning. It was uh, extraordinarily hot. 
Uh, but they didn't let me in on the joke, so they sent me a 32-ounce crowler of this beer that was, you know, basically after two ounces, you got all the information you need on that one. So I'm just <laughs> like, I think in the guide I referred to it as more of a challenge than a beverage. <laughs> Uh, but you can do it. You can make a beer that's so bad that nobody will ever uh, want you to make it again. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they tried that with old Milwaukee ice. <laughs> I like that you're chewing on these ideas of a seasonal beer. We we talk about what is the sweet spot, at least at Rebellion. We talk about the sweet spot of how many beers is too many. How many is not enough? So we have our cores that never go away and they stick around year round. And maybe after a year, we'll vote one off the island like oatmeal stout. We're going to take it out to the woodshed and give it the old yeller treatment. But we still have to have our core lineup. And then the seasonals hit. So we do like a spring, fall, winter, you know. And right now it's it's a hazy IPA, nice and gentle, big and boozy for those snuggly winter days when you want something juicy we've got cat's got the cream which is a vanilla cream ale it features mexican vanilla authentic cinnamon you know they got the big cinnamon sticks just like you're talking when they clogged up the pump and uh I'll, rhubarb crisp it tastes like rhubarb crisp dessert that my grandma made it's wild and we put the little corral plate design on it to kind of remind you of like going to grandma's house uh, you could probably do it as an ice cream float yeah. But they're very limited. Um, the rhubarb is already sold out. Like, we, di- we didn't even announce it, and it's sold out. The cat's got the cream. It's, it's very, very quickly becoming one of our most popular beers, but we take it away at yeah. right before the end of winter. You have to. And yeah. People scream at us. They're like, no, bring it back. They'll hoard it. They hoard it in their basement. And I'm like, don't. Just enjoy it while you have it. And then... Love it when it comes back because in the summertime, nobody fucking drinks it. It's pointless. Well, but the other thing is, uh, and it's a, an observation made in a novel by Anthony Burgess. I think it's the Enderby trilogy. I mean, they start out with Enderby, who's a you know a failed poet who's living in a boarding house or something, um, and he he stumbles out of his apartment in the afternoon to go get a drink, and he orders a second beer or second drink, and the way he orders it is to use the word similar. Because you can never actually have the same beer twice. Like the vanilla cream ale, if you have it six months later and you put it in your cellar, it's not going to be the same experience. It's one of the things that makes cask ale, for instance, in England so compelling, is the fact that, you know, it might not be the same tomorrow. So this, uh, the quintessence of it really is the fact that you are consuming something very briefly. And you have to enjoy it in the moment. And, you know, there, there are... People who have written about that, as A. E. Houseman, for example, the English poet, has um, a series of poems called A Shropshire Lad. And it, it contains, the poem contains the line, Malt does more than Milton can to justify God's ways to man, which is nice sentiment. But there's a second line which is basically saying, yeah, that's true in the moment, uh, and it's fine, but that's going to pass, you know? Uh, the enjoyment is the important part. It, it doesn't actually solve any problems. If you get really drunk, you're just going to wake up by the side of the road on the way back from the Ludlow Fair. So don't do that. You got to, it's, it's about moderation and enjoyment. Uh, and from a brewing standpoint, I mean, the real issue is every time you introduce a product, it's going to be somebody's favorite product. And you're always going to hear that from somebody. Uh, one, one of the things that I always liked was that, you know, cask beer in Toronto, Bar Volo back in the day, you'd get like one-off casks. There's actually a beer in my fridge from Black Oak at the moment, which is based on one of those, just a pale ale with pineapple juice in it. But it was something that happened once, and people said, oh, that's great, why don't you make it all the time? And the answer is, because we don't want to make it all the time. Um, but you had a nice time while you were drinking it, so that's a, that's a good thing. If you look at the, the larger market, uh, people introducing brands just to keep up with the Joneses, that's a real issue. I mean, you know... Molson Canadian Light 67 or whatever is still in the market in some form because somebody liked it and they have to keep making it because they'll complain if they don't. Like the discount value brand section is full of all this woeful stuff that's left over, like old Vienna. Now in Western Ontario, that's a big deal, but the rest of everywhere in Canada, old Vienna is not so much of a thing. 
my grandpa drank. Uh, over yeah. There. It was wretched. Yes, it's not good. But in Windsor, Ontario, if you're out for a night on the town, you're going to be drinking a lot of OV, baby. <laughs> That's like licking metal pipes that are rusty. <laughs> little... Like, I think OV might have been the very first beer that I've ever tasted because I snuck it from my grandpa. He's like, here, have a little sip of this. And I was kind of like gagged and ran away, you know, back to play with the kids. And I've never forgotten how awful that flavor was. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's always weird. You, you do have that, like, nascent impression of whatever the first beer was. And for me, uh, I'm pretty sure it was like Labatt Blue or something, because we went to baseball games and stuff. You, know, you get a sip of beer if you're at the baseball game. But uh, apparently, one time when I was about six months old, no, six years old, we'd gone on vacation to Vermont, and my cousin snuck a Catamount Pale Ale out of the fridge. Catamount was like an early craft brewer that doesn't exist anymore. So... I got to say to Stephen Beaumont, who writes the World Atlas of Beer the other uh, month when we were talking about I tried that, you know. <laughs> they went out of business when I was 11 or something. <laughs> <laughs> I Circling back to the finding the sweet spot, we say, how much is too much? Can the consumer keep up with us? Have we, we look at the idea of have we incorrectly trained people to chase the thing that is new? Or is it okay to constantly be testing and iterating and kind of flexing our muscles, never letting ourselves get stale, always offering our brewers a challenge so they are interested and not getting bored of brewing the same damn thing over and over again. It's it's a it's an interesting thing to see Toronto because you guys are like a crystal ball for us because your market is a little bit ahead. And when I talk to you, I'm like, interesting. If is that where we're going to go? But on the other hand, is that where we want to take our market i don't know well i mean here's the problem from my perspective right like a bunch of people will get in touch with me via facebook messenger or twitter dms or whatever on a weekly basis and they'll say have you tried this thing it's not very good i don't like uh <laughs> is that how you're choosing to enjoy things now <laughs> just like okay we're gonna go around the city we're gonna get everything that everybody made we're gonna talk about whether it sucks I mean, essentially what you've got is a decentralized network of criticism, which has like tendency towards being the prevailing thought construct. <laughs> it's not good. Um, you know, you're supposed to enjoy the thing. You're supposed to drink stuff you like. Like you're not supposed to go out and like, uh, people said this brewery was getting better. I bought a bunch of beers and styles I don't like and I hated them. That brewery's bad. What? <laughs> you people are crazy. Um, this I mean, chocolate that, beer had too much chocolate in it. Yeah. I mean, the, the ridiculous thing is, right, like, we are living through a golden age. There's more good beer than there has ever been. The quality on average is higher than it's ever been. Um, probably people have more access to more interesting stuff than ever. And everybody hates it. <laughs> it's just like, you know... One of the things that I've really developed an appreciation for over the last year or so is Steam Whistle Pilsner. And Steam Whistle, I, I understand, has a controversial reputation in the rest of Canada because they're in markets where people don't really care about them. You know, they're not the local beer. It's not a thing. And I get that. That's fine. And, you know, even for me, like growing up here, I guess Steam Whistle started when I was like 20, and they were always going to be the best beer at a bad bar. Like if you went to a Firkin or if you went to like one of the Irish chain pubs or a Moxie's or whatever, I don't know what you guys have. Boston pizza. <laughs> Steam Whistle is going to be like the best beer that they have. And because it is like the high end beer, nobody's ordering it. So it gets old. And then they open their beer garden and I'm sitting there drinking like a liter Stein of Steam Whistle Pilsner, fresh from the bright tank, because that's how they serve it, unfiltered. And I'm just like, this is incredible. Why aren't I drinking this all the time? Like, and, and the level of hype and chasing stuff that needs to exist. Like, okay, we've got this series of single hop smash beers. This one has Sabro in it. This one has like uh, cashmere or HBC 469 Laurel or whatever it is. Um, you know, it's a, it's a hop that nobody's ever heard of. It's got a number. We used a hundred kilos of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
you know, like chasing that is insane because it's it's really you're you're buying somebody's experiment. Yeah. From my perspective, right? Like, I still think of myself as a beer critic, and my job is to recommend things based on the fact that they're good, not necessarily on the on the fact that they exist. <laughs> so, I mean, the choice is between suggesting things that people will enjoy or trying to chart the night sky. And the night sky version of that, where everybody's trying everything all the time, is it's exhausting for one thing. It is very difficult to feel like you're enjoying yourself and doing that. Like Saturday afternoon, we just went to Godspeed and drank Oktoberfest beer all day. Like I think I drank six pints of Oktoberfest beer on an empty stomach. Don't do that. I mean, have breakfast. <laughs> If, if there's one lesson you should take away from this, it's have breakfast. Um, but, you know, it, it was great. It was delicious. I didn't really want to try anything else. You know, you can just be happy with something that's really good. You don't have to pretend like there's something you're missing. You can just, you know, that's a different day. I love that you you took that there because in my mind, what I've been wrestling with, especially in the last 12 months with beer geek friends or friends who are just kind of getting into craft beer now and forming opinions is the question of quality uh, talking about balance with them or what the malt character is, whether the thing is fucking exploding or <laughs> infected. Like I had a friend lecturing me. He's like, man, your beer fucking sucks. And I only want to drink this. And I'm like, that beer tastes like popcorn. It's infected fuck <laughs> yeah and, but to him the the er experience the authenticity was going to that little tiny small place rather than was it well balanced was it what the brewer intended did it have off flavors like if you if you don't want your beer to have a popcorn flavor and it has a popcorn flavor you fucked up and i think that to me is kind of what i've been thinking about the last 12 months a lot is that the need for quality it's it's not just that the thing exists you know that chasing that everything that's new if the quality is not there the brewer fucked up and when you talked about steam whistle fresh from the bright tank that pills yeah fresh from the source makes total pure sense to me like it's not a shitty beer they're big because they were good at doing that thing fresh not only that but I got a coupon for a free pretzel. <laughs> so when you said to me, you went to steam whistle and you got their pills, it reminded me of a story. Mark Heisey, the re president of rebellion. He said to me, he went down to Texas and he, there's this little brew pub there and they have this beer called industry pills. And he said, <laughs> nobody drinks it except the local brewers or the local industry people said so they'll, they'll go, they'll hang out after hours and they just want to drink this nice, clean, not fucked up, perfect Pilsner. And so they, they just have it in house. They don't can it. They don't distribute it. Just industry pills because it's for the people who know, who know oh, yeah. your beer's not supposed to have popcorn. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, <laughs> it's it's one of the problems that you have with modern craft beer is that the big ticket, like the high profile item is always the hop character. So, you know, back when I was getting into this, we had the first smash beer in Ontario, it was Smash Bomb from Flying Monkeys. And originally it was a Citra smash beer. And at the time, everybody was like, oh, you can do that? Just one hop? <laughs> I mean, come on. Um, so... You know, they did that, and, and subsequently, you know, people can latch on to these ideas, like, this is what I like is this flavor over here, but they don't understand any of the other things that are happening in the beer, right? Like, if you go to a home brewing shop, we have some good ones in Toronto. Toronto Brewing, for example, has like 130, 140 different varieties of malt, different providers, different, like, eventually you get to the point, if you're a really serious beer person, like, um, you know, I, I do periodically make a living from uh, quality control and assurance panels and that kind of thing. Like I've instructed that course at Niagara College. So I absolutely understand that there's a difference not only between like two row pale malts, like based on their provenance and based on who's doing the malting, but also how fresh they are. 
So like we, we did a project the other year where I was working for a company called Taste Guru. It was like a startup and we were creating an AI in order to, to do that. We had to taste 500 beers blind. And you know, you never actually taste anything blind, especially not that large a, I mean, you might do it in judging, but not that large a selection. And I'm sitting there and I'm tasting beer without knowing what it is. I mean, I've got like the visual aspect of it to look at. And I can tell the difference between barley and barley and corn and barley and rice. And I'm like picking out different base grains with a hundred percent success rate over the course of this thing that we were doing. I'm just like, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time doing this. I have gotten very good at something that's extremely esoteric. Like there's, there's no reason to be able to do that. I, I was able to pick out beers blind. Like I picked out Radeberger from nowhere on a 500 beer lineup. And I'm just sort of like, all right, um, how do you convey that like level of knowledge to people? And because I'm teaching the beer course, I just decided to go straight at it. Like, yeah, it's, it's easy to like a really big flavorful IPA, but if you can get people to taste Molson Canadian, Budweiser, Moosehead and Alexander Keith side by side, and you can get them to come up with nice little nuances between those beers, that's a much more useful exercise in, terming, in terms of getting people to understand ingredients and nuance and subtlety, uh, as opposed to just, here's some juice. Um, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating to watch, because there's so much stuff that, that you lose as a result of hype. Like, people don't really necessarily understand yeast strains except as how they pertain to their favorite New England IPA. London 3, oh my god, it's made with London 3. Uh, or, you know, people understand what oats do now, but you've lost everything in malt darker than Karaminic 1. Um, until you get to pastry stout, at which point it's all Carafa 3. <laughs> um, you know, so I don't know how to fix that problem. But I think the solution is to have brewers make things that they actually want to brew. I mean, experimentation is, is it's a problem because sometimes you're gonna make things that people don't really want. So you have to have a pilot system or something. Um, and sometimes it's hard to sell people a black lager. But if it's good enough, like if you've put enough time into it and you've got people who understand why it's important, why the brewer wants to do it, I mean, you, you're, ideally you're building a community, right, of people who are interested in your product and will take you your word for the fact that they should try something. So you're really not selling the beer. You're selling the, the company, you're selling the story, you're selling the, the, the effort that's gone into it. Like, we think this is a good idea, and this here's why, you know? Uh, so you're not worried quite as much about, like, <laughs> we've made a Polish Grinsiski. It's a weird smoked wheat beer. Here, try it. Um, you, you know, if you can come up with a better story than that, it helps. I think when you say that, it reminds me of when you said it's about the experience. And what is the virtue of the experience? Uh, we connect it to farmers here. Saskatchewan is home to some of the best barley, if not the best barley for brewing in the world. We know Sierra Nevada comes here. We know other big brewers come here. And now we have hop growers figuring out hops, figuring out the soil composition, what grows well here. And we were out walking through the fields, picking varietals. We're, we're experimenting with wet hop beers, one of which we're going to be shipping you uh, like yesterday or today. And I think when you said it's about bringing people together, it's, uh, we have this real thing going on in Saskatchewan right now with like crazy people talking about Western separation and people in the rural parts of the province are pissed off at the cities and the urban centers are just exasperated with the rural. They're like, just come on, like, let's get moving on some of these social issues. Just get behind it. And the rural says, you don't understand us. We're suffering economically. We we feel like we're getting left out of participation in the full rest of society. And it's so much more complex than that. And I feel like we get to say, look, we're all connected and we need each other to survive. 
we buy your grain that you make that's world class and we're turning it to awesome stuff. And instead of shipping it out across the world where it gets taxed somewhere else and then sold back to us and refined. And I'm going to take a shot at Ontario here. Ontario has not always been kind to Saskatchewan. We've seen the old political cartoons with the, the cow being fed in the West and milked in the East. And we have that structure still today where we don't have those diverse economic pieces to help us have a, a very horizontal or even vertical control of the industry. We still, we pull everything out of the ground, whether it's oil, grains, you know, that kind of stuff, and we ship it away. And now we're saying as brewers, we're saying as a company, we're going to keep that stuff here and we're going to keep it local and we're going to make it ours, our way. And we're going to help you farmers. And not only do the taxes we pay go back to supporting building your roads and helping keep your farm going and the lights on and the phone infrastructure and getting internet out to you. Like we're building a community that's even bigger and more diverse and stronger. And I think that's where I want to take the message. That's where I want to say people look, this is the real end game. We're making great friggin' beer right here with our stuff. You're drinking Saskatchewan. And oh, yeah. I'm, I don't know if people care or listen yet. <laughs> Man, they're about to. I mean, <laughs> I don't know if you've checked the news recently, but Yakima is like one good guest of wind for burning down. So <laughs> local hops might come into play sooner than everybody expects. One of the things that I've been really happy with is, like in Ontario, we're kind of going through the same thing. We don't have the same barley kind of situation. Northern Ontario grows some. And there are like hobby farmers in Southern Ontario. But we do have a lot of hop yards, and I've actually been working on a hop rub protocol for the Ontario Hop Growers Association on a volunteer unpaid basis because, uh, you know, let's face it, I started working on it in late February, and by March 16th, phew, nah, nothing. I uh, couldn't even ship hops out. Um, but I've got a, this entire, like, organoleptic profiling thing. And one of the things we're trying to do is like sell the local hops to people in the province. It's like, how do you get people to care about the fact that you've got local people growing Cascade and Centennial and Columbus and you know, all the sea hops that aren't copyrighted? Cashmere, for example. Um, and the answer is, I think you have to sell it to them on the basis that the terroir is unique. Like this does something that you can't get anywhere else. And in order to do that, you actually need experts to like rub the hops and come up with language that will explain them. Like, I've actually come up with like a scintillating jar technique and some other stuff. But, you know, you're selling them to the public. That's the thing that everybody seems to not quite get, is that it doesn't matter whether you sell the hops to the brewers, the brewers then have to use them. And in order for them to sell that beer, the public needs to care about the fact that the hops have been grown locally. So it's this entire effort across the whole industry to point out to people that like local ingredients are really important. I got a handbook from Labatt from about 1933. Hang on. So this is from the era when Labatt was cool. Like they were okay. And they were still owned by Canadians. So it's got, this is exactly the same stuff, but it's 1938. That it's all the stuff that you tell people now in a beer class, like the Cicerone program. This was the 1938 version. So there's this great couple of pages. What beer has done for the Ontario farmer? Value of the barley crop has gone up between 1932 and 1936. Purchasing power of the farmer has gone up. Labatt uses nearly a half million bushels of barley a year, and they're all grown in this section of Ontario down here by Hamilton. So they've got a map, like they're selling the concept, not only to the people who are selling the beer, but to the publicans and all that stuff. And it just says, getting people off relief, because this is the end of the Great Depression, remember? We're just getting into World War II. Great Depression might become relevant real soon now. <laughs> uh, when you order a glass of Labatt's India Pale Ale, you help employ the waiter, the barman, the hotel owner, the warehouseman, the railwayman, the truck driver, the mechanic who looks after the truck, the man who loads the barrels, the man who fills the barrels, the filling room attendant, the man who looks after the vats, the brewmaster, the mash room man, the maltster, and hundreds of others, glass workers, coopers, carters, etc., who are dependent on the brewing industry. Wage earners employed in Ontario breweries in 1935 paid $1.253 million, which is 
pretty much what you see now from the Canadian Brewers uh, Beer Canada. It's nice to see the thing come full circle, but it would be nicer to have the ingredients back and a little more character to the beer. That's one of the exciting things about the University of Saskatchewan. They have an entire ag lab. The barley guys are growing barley to spec for craft beer now. I got to walk through the fields with the farmers who grow the barley and talk to them about Metcalf and Maris Otter and all, all this protein levels and all this wacky stuff. And they've got drones flying through the wheat and through the barley fields measuring and spraying and fertilizing like it's oh, yeah, next level science it's, that ac metcalf it's pretty high yield it's uh mckinnon in ontario they use that they have a beer it's a mckinnon harvest ale it's like it's kind of like an oktoberfest ale if that makes sense but it's available year round now and they grow ac metcalf on their farm the mckinnon boys have been seed farmers since about 1787 they've been in bath ontario since the first tavern in ontario existed in bath if that makes sense. Um, and they're growing Mackinac hops. So that this is a beer that's 100% estate grown. And I love that. I mean, it's brilliant in the sense that not only is it, you know, fairly sustainable, but they've got local industry. They're hiring people. They're, they're like, uh, you know, very popular around Kingston, Ontario, mostly because if they show up with the crew, they're going to spend like 300 bucks on drinks. <laughs> They, they roll like a rugby team. Um, but, it, you know, it's, it's another example. It's kind of like Godspeed. It's people who are doing the thing that they want to do. They're doing it their way. And they've got the ability to do that. And one of the problems that I see, you know, with... We got 450 brewing entities in Ontario, according to the spreadsheet that I'm continuously updating. One of the things that I see are people who don't know what they want. Like, they have no vision for the thing. They got into it because they thought... Oh, we'll have a craft brewery. It'll make some money. Or like, we're gonna, we have a property. We should do something with it. Or you know, two brothers were sitting in their basement and decided one day that they would become brewers. Two brothers. It's just called two brothers. That's. Yeah. We literally have a brewery that just opened called Brothers Brewing. No, we have one of those in Guelph. It's Asa and Colton Provo. They're twins. So there's a little twist on the story. <laughs> They're nice guys, but it, it's not like that's not enough to sell the thing you know it's good that it exists but it needs more conceptual framework than that to hang some stuff on we're, we're going to find some leveling i think what's going to happen really is it's not going to be a bubble it's going to be people realizing that maybe they could be doing things that are more profitable with their time or maybe they just don't really have as much fun as they thought they were going to because let's face it brewing is not like a massively profitable industry at low volumes i mean it's a nice way to make a living it's a terrible way to make a fortune <laughs> we were saying if you want to be a millionaire in brewing, start with a billion bucks. Yep. <laughs> Pretty much, man. You know, another good example of this in Ontario, we got Bench Brewing. They're down in Beamsville. Yep, I've had Bench. Yeah, and they've got like the uh, Belgian style louvers on the side of the building. It's the cool ship, right? They've got oak fooders they're aging stuff in, and they've got orchards out back. Their water irrigation, like their uh, water treatment system, actually irrigates the fruit trees that they're using to make beer with. And that's a lovely closed circle, sustainable kind of model for, uh, you know, it, it just makes sense holistically. And, and that's great. The, the fact that they're making Belgian-style stuff is fantastic. Plum Grove, for example, it won, like, best sour beer in the world at the World Beer Room Awards last year. So, you know, they're doing something right. That feels like a great opportunity for us to jump into you actually making a beer recommendation. What are you drinking right now? What, sh what should we be checking out? Well, uh, because the Blue Jays have made the playoffs, I am bandwagoning pretty hard. So I have a beer called uh, Ice Cold Beer. It's made by Left Field. And this is going to tie stuff together. Watch this. This is how good I am. It's going to come back. Hang on. This is a four-pack of beer made by Left Field. Uh, Left Field, I actually wrote a book with Mark Murphy, who's the uh, one of the owners there. Uh, it's Mark and Mandy Murphy. And this is a 100% Ontario ale. And the great thing about it is that they're using like local malt, local hops. They've got the independent brewer's seal on there, so you've got that feature. 
And this is a departure from everything else they do. It's outside their normal branding. They've got like a little mascot kind of guy on it. 4.5%, real popular with baseball, um, especially currently. You know, if there's a guy in Skydome, one of the vendors who just, nobody calls it the Rogers, so it's Skydome if you're from Toronto. Um, walks around yelling ice cold beer and he sells people beer. And this is a beer that they've made to honor a vendor at the Skydome uh, using entirely Ontario malt, probably from Barnell Malting in Hastings County. I don't know, they could be using stuff from uh, Thunder Bay from Canada Malting. I should probably check on that with them. But, uh, you know, they're using Ontario hops as well. And probably they're getting their yeast from Escarpment Labs, which is in Guelph. And the thing I like about it is it's not a lager. It's like a cream ale. It's a very basic beer. It's, you know, kind of old school. The final gravity on it is high enough that it's a little bit sweet, like it's not completely dried out like a lager. And it's got that wholesome barley character to it. It feels like you're drinking beer. It feels like, you know, if there were ghost fans in the stadium at the Ghost Arena in Field of Dreams, this is what they would be drinking. It's like the ghost of barley has made it into that can. <laughs> um, and I, I love that. You know, you're sitting here on a sweltering September afternoon. It's 30 degrees with the humidity in Toronto right now. You're listening to the soothing tones of Buck Martinez. And uh, he's just calling a baseball game that doesn't matter because they already made the playoffs. That's <laughs> it's the perfect thing, you know? I, I love that. I went to the brewery the other day. I, I ran into Mark and Mandy on the street before I got there, and I turned up at the brewery, and the guy said to me, uh, Mandy called me before you got here. We're supposed to give you whatever beer you want, and we're not supposed to take your money even if you insist. And I'm just like, <laughs> aw, I wanted to support a local business. I'll take that, 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 and that. <laughs> it was a very quick turnaround. I mean, I didn't feel bad for long. That's a good feeling. Yeah. I had a friend come in last week, and I slid her one of our new hoodies. And I just said, your money's no good. Just tip the, tip the server. Tip her very, very well. I got your first couple pints. And they fought with me. They argued. And they're like, but I really want to support you. And I'm like, I love that you want to support me. Come back tomorrow when your money's good again. Today I got you. And this is just me to say, this is my hug for you. There are not a lot of benefits to owning a craft brewery. But the ability to periodically surprise people with largesse is kind of a nice one. I mean, one of the things that I realized, I was re rewriting, rewriting the... Uh, medieval history portion of the beer class I teach. And there's this tradition that they don't talk about that's from about the 6th century AD. And it's the way that Christianity catches on in Europe. And it, it's not that the monks liked beer. It's that the monks would give people beer. So there's this tradition called Klosterschenk, or monastery pub. So, you know, you would go to church, yes, but you would also be given beer when you went to church. So if you want to build a congregation, that's a real good way to do it. It is uh, not really an evangelical thing, but it is a good way to build support locally. People do like a pint of beer. Kick the shit out of all the witches and then take no, it over. That, that's, that's, <laughs> like, that's like six centuries later. The alewives, are, that's an English thing. That's, oh, that's an English the thing. other side of the channel. Uh, you know, I also tell them about the witches which is a lot of fun because, you know, I've, I've taught the class for three years now and I've gotten to the point where I've built up the material so they can't necessarily see it coming. It says, witches, that's how you get witches. If you want witches, that's how you get witches. That's alewives. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> the beer I brought to share with you or talk about was Spectrum Ale Works. It's their English pub ale, ESB, 5.5% uh, ABV. I actually haven't had it yet. What I have done is had about four of their other beers. So this is kind of going to be a, a virgin taste test for me. There it is. 46 minutes in and we've gotten to the sound of a beer opening in the podcast. That's de rigueur. Everybody needs that. It's, it's nice. It's got a really nice, easy, grainy quality to it. The aromas, like that toasted malt. ESB is not a style I chase down. 
I think the last time I had an ESB was about two years ago in BC at, uh, a, you know, Kicking Horse Coffee. Yeah. So right beside Kicking Horse Coffee is a brewery called Arrowhead. And I had everything on their menu and their ESB completely like took me by surprise. And I was like, holy fuck, this is the first ESB I've ever had that I truly enjoy. Oh yeah. <laughs> it's entirely possible. <laughs> I mean, there are great ones out there. It's just that you don't get the great ones. What you get are the ones that were successful enough in England to get purchased by a company that would transport them internationally. And then stale on a shelf and oxidize. Yes. Have a, have a year old can of Bombardier, you know, it's Bombardier or whatever it is. Rick Mayall used to do the answer to those. He was great. Um, this is fantastic. I, I like this. How strong so, is it? It's only 5.5%. It's just, I'm so shocked. I thought this was going to be okay. I don't, this is nice. Well, you know, the thing is that there's room for all of the stuff that exists between old man farty beer and uh, your juicy sippy cup beer and your pastry stout have a donut beer. And uh, we'll just refer to those from now on as Joey Bega Donuts. It's, um... <laughs> trademark it, trademark it. Um, but like that's, th that's three things. There's all this other like range and spectrum of malt flavor, hop flavor, yeast, like fermentation profile alcohol content there's so much stuff and hopefully what you end up with eventually is just a good one of everything and it would be fantastic if you know more people would buy into that concept because you know how much orange juice can you really drink two and then i got heartburn yeah pretty much man it's uh I find that they're really massively flavorful beers. That's not necessarily a great choice if you're going to be sessioning things. Um, you know, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a cream ale. I mean, if it's made well, if you don't have the massive DMS and, like, diacetyl issues. <laughs> um, you know, there, there's all this, like, nuance and possibility. There's a great brewery here called Sun and Hill. Um, I say great. They're very new. But everything I've had from them has been good. And, and they tend to work in like the light saison grisette kind of territory. And that's a, a very difficult thing to do reliably because it's Belgian yeast strain. God knows what it's going to do. Um, and I, I just like, I, I appreciate the fact that they're trying to do something that isn't, you know, here's another hazy IPA, add it to the giant pile of hazy IPAs. At some point, at some point, the, the, the wave will break against the shore that is the uh, market preference. <laughs> and we'll see, like, people trying different things again. I, I'm so jacked that I got to sit down with you and that you agreed to come on the podcast. Uh, I feel like I've learned some new things and just got to talk with somebody who I've generally just tried to make laugh on Twitter for years. So I'm glad I finally got to sit down with you. Well, you finally made me laugh. So that, yeah, that was great. <laughs> See, I told you I was trying to work on not being a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for your time today, man. Yeah, hey, my pleasure. Thanks for listening today. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, be sure to join us on our brand new Facebook group page, The Rebellion Brewing Podcast. I'm going to include links in the show notes so you can find Jordan on his blog, St. John's Wirt, or on Twitter, it's Saints Gambit, at Saints Gambit. Just check him out. He's got so much knowledge packed in his brain, I feel like I learn every single time I read one of his articles. I'm also proud to let you know that we're members of the Saskatchewan Podcast Network. It's a one-stop shop for tons of locally produced shows from across our province. If you're into Saskatchewan produced stories, you can find them, the vast majority of them, at saskpodcastnetwork.com. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Untapped so you don't miss out on the latest news in Saskatchewan craft beer. As always, thank you for joining the Rebellion.